What's up, Game of Throners? It's your boy DJ11 here, back at you with another recap and review of episode 4, season 6, The Stranger. What's up? I was so hyped after this episode. This was, I mean, this episode was literally like a, it was a book reader's wet dream. That's all there was to say about it. I've actually heard people say, oh, it was kind of a snooze fest until the end. Are you crazy? All that tells me is you didn't read the books, because anybody who read the books, how could you not be pumped after this? They gave us so much, finally, finally. I mean, we saw Tormund getting smitten. We got to see the actual weapons, the real actual weapons of a great fighter, not just some crazy off, I don't know what the, I mean, yeah, still Dawn was. Um, dude, we got to see a Stark reunion. We got to see the pink letter. What the freaking pink letter? And none of that was even the highlight of the episode? You gotta be kidding me. How can you not say this episode was dope? It was amazing. It's hard for me to ever give an episode a 10, but I mean, for me, this was a 9.5. It was... It was just, I mean, oh my god. Yeah, it left a huge smile on my face and left me very satisfied. Let's get into it. We open on Longclaw, back at Castle Black. Where are you gonna go? South. What are you gonna do? Get warm. John's packing and Ed's not happy about it. I was with you at Hard Home. You know what's coming. How could you leave us now? Because I got betrayed and Caesared by my own so-called brothers. We hear a horn blow, which is a little odd because it wasn't Rangers returning, but oh well, it is Sansa! So let's all finally just enjoy a happy Stark reunion. In front of the fire with John and Sansa reminiscing on old Nan's pies, wishing they never left Winterfell. Sansa asks, then makes, John forgive her for always being such a snooty little shit to him. Still a bit of the highborn in her, I see. Forgive me! Okay, okay. Again, for a second time, John gets asked, where will you go? Where will we go? If I don't watch over you, your father's ghost will come back and murder me. I don't know about you, but every time the word ghost comes up around John, the theory juices just start flowing. Did anybody else wonder why he said, your father will come back and not our father? What did John really find out while he was dead? Sansa says it's time to go home. John's tired of fighting, but Sansa tells him if we don't take back Winterfell, we'll never be safe. I want you to help me, but I'll do it alone if I have to. Milady, Sir Davos, and here comes my favorite scene of the episode. Will you stay at Castle Black? I'll do as Jon Snow commands. You serve Jon Snow now. He is the prince that was promised. Forgive me, my lady, but I thought that was Stannis. And Melisandre exits stage left. But Davos is like, fuck that, I want some answers. What happened down there? There was a battle. Stannis was defeated. And Shireen, what happened to the princess? I saw what happened. Enter the Lady of Tarth. Now, Brienne is in no way my favorite character, but this was by far my favorite scene with her from the show or the books. She just walks up with sword in hand and tells it true, like a stone-cold boss. Yeah, I killed him, and then shot them both a look like, and I haven't made up my mind about you two yet. Davos is confused. Milady, um, I know who you are. I was on Renly's Kingsguard before he was assassinated by blood magic, and Melisandre has a little sharp moment of her own. Here we get a little glimpse of how Davos feels and why he doesn't hate Melisandre. That was in the past, we're dealing with today. If Davos wants revenge on Melisandre, then that may justify Brienne killing Davos. We do what we have to in the depths of war. We'll see if he feels any different when he finds out she actually burned Shireen. It's in the past, but that doesn't mean I forget. Or forgive. He admitted it, you know. Who did? Stannis, just before I executed him. What a great scene. Speaking of like a boss, cut to Sweet Robin, and yep, he's still worthless at arms, but enter one who's by no means worthless, Uncle Peter! Littlefinger's back and wastes no time putting his plans in action. Royce tries to step up, but immediately gets let known what time it is and cowers away, glad to still have his life. Littlefinger is not afraid to play life or death chicken in the veil. That look he gives Royce when Robin asks if they should throw him through the moon door is priceless. Littlefinger's like, you like to play games, little man? Everyone's little when it comes to scheming compared to Littlefinger. After dispensing a Lord Royce, he turns his cunning back on Robin. I bring good news. My friends in the north tell me Sansa has escaped and is headed for Castle Black. But she won't be safe there. She's my cousin. We should help her. That was my instinct as well. The ultimate chess champion. He is king at seeing the whole board and moving the pieces at his will. Our lord has spoken. Gather the knights of the Vale. It's time to join the fray. The fray. Interesting choice of words. Over to Marine, and Tyrion is trying to end the raids of the Harpy. He says military tactics aren't working, so he'll try a more diplomatic approach. Melisande and Grey Worm try to explain to Tyrion that he doesn't understand the masters and this will not work. He asks what they want. They want him to go. He tries to explain they don't really need slaves and bribes them with prostitutes, also giving them seven years. 
There's that number again, seven. I think this just shows how truly out of touch Tyrion is with this side of the world. While giving his terms, Varys shoots Melisande a look like this little twat is off his rocker. After the meeting, Grey Worm tells Tyrion, you won't use them, they'll use you. The only thing I really got from this scene, other than how out of element, how out of his element Tyrion is, is when the masters say, we don't fund the harpy. Tyrion doesn't believe him and says, yes, but you'll quit funding them all the same. I don't think these masters have anything to do with the harpy, and this scene leads me back to believing that Varys is the harpy. I thought the harpy was going to be Dario, and that's why he had the boats burned so Danny couldn't leave him, but now I'm back to thinking it's Varys, because he really doesn't want Danny to go to Westeros. He's primed it for Aegon to take the throne, and Varys makes more sense of the harpy. Dario's a skilled fighter. Varys is the skilled schemer. Out to our dragon trackers, and Dario tells Jorah he's too old to ride the dragon. It's hard enough for him, and he's a young man. Oh, he's talking about Danny. They creep to the borders of Dothrak, and Jorah has a pretty good idea where Danny's being held. It's forbidden to carry weapons in the sacred city. You're asking a dog to hand over its teeth. There's a hundred thousand of them down there. We won't be able to fight our way out. Now see, here might not be a big deal for most, but I love seeing Dario take off the weapons he was supposed to have. Again, epic fail on Dawn, guys. But hey, this is a positive review, and I love the nod to his ladies. He's known for fighting with two swords, an Eric, a Dothraki curved sword, and a regular straight sword with naked women on their pommels. So yeah, it was just a quick flash of him, but as a reader, I really appreciated seeing him and them staying true. He's an amazing fighter with specialized weapons, and I love to get to actually see him. I like the fact that they stayed true to the story on this one. As Dario's about to hand over his knife, he sees Jorah's grayscale. You know what happens? I know what happens. Don't worry, it didn't touch you. After that, Dario's like, I'll do it myself. Like, you can keep your grayscale infected mitts off my ladies. Now, I don't know about you, but every time after that, when they were sneaking through the city and Jorah would get close, I would have been like, yeah, can you stay back just a little bit? In the city, the two get spotted, so they have to kill. Dario takes off after the one to get him before he alerts the others, while Jorah gets absolutely manhandled by the other one. He gets beat soundly, and in desperation, he flings sand at the man. The two share a look like, really? And Jorah's like, yeah, that was pretty weak. Just as Jorah gets snatched up by the neck and is getting choked out, squish a blade through the heart. You have to appreciate the sound effects this show has. Dario saves Jorah, but now they spilt blood in the sacred city. So to mask it, he spills more blood by squishing the dead body with a boulder. I thought you weren't allowed to spill bloody at all in the sacred city, but I guess in the show you just can't use blades. I don't know. In with the Dosh Colleen, and the Elder fills Danny in on the other Khaleesi's. We are not queens here, but the cows depend on us for our wisdom. I hope they let you stay with us. The other option is not very pleasant. I must make water. You can't run from the Dothraki, you know. I will never run from the Dothraki. Danny steps outside with the youngest Khaleesi, saying she needed fresh air. The old women stink. Oh, is this where Dragon's gonna come and save her? Nope, it's Dario and Jorah. Danny tells them they'd never make it out alive. Was anybody else thinking it was a good thing that it was Dario who grabbed the Dosh Colleen girl and not Jorah, the way Danny grabbed his arm right where the Grace Carol would be? Jorah says they must try, and Danny tells them they can do more than that. She has a plan. Pan to a down but not beaten Marjorie, and the High Sparrow wants to talk. Of course, I still can't wait for him to get ran through, but I actually enjoyed this scene, and hearing his backstory was pretty cool. Come, let's go see him. Who? Your brother. Wait, what kind of trap is this? She does get taken to see Loras, and sees he is broken. There's absolutely no fight left in him. He's just become another reek, even to the point of looking like him. Marjorie sees his true despair as he begs her to do whatever it takes to make them stop. So that was the High Sparrow's plan all along, to show her that he's broken Loras. Cersei walks in on Pycelle giving Tommen counsel and is not having it. Get out. Didn't you just love his little fuck you with his slow, debilitated walk? Then a little pause at the door. <laughs> Motherfucker, we know you can walk. We've seen you doing jumping jacks after having sex with young prostitutes. Then Tommen lets Cersei know that he's talked with the High Sparrow. He's afraid of him. Mother, there's something I want to tell you. I promised the High Sparrow I wouldn't tell anybody. Okay, so we know the High Sparrow played Tommen, and now we know how. He promised not to tell anyone, so of course the High Sparrow knew he'd tell Cersei straight away, so it'll be interesting to see how all that goes down. So now we know when the Tyrell army shows up to the Sips, the Sparrows will be ready and waiting, but the Queen of Thorns has been pretty consistent throughout the show with her better them than us attitude. Remember that talk she had with Tyrion when planning Joffrey's wedding? She'll have that army ready for the secret Sparrow attack, I'm thinking. Or, that talk with Tyrion was foreshadowing. As a matter of fact, the more I think of it, the more I'm leaning that way. You are the few, we are the many. If we don't keep them entertained, it could very well end up us with our heads on those spikes. 
And what was with the rains of Castamere playing in the background? Which house is going to go extinct? Sea means sea, as far as the eye can see, and we arrive at Pike. For now, Asha slash Yara sits her father's sea stone chair, and she is not happy with Rion. Yep, still somewhere between Reek and Theon. Good men died trying to save you. I'm sorry. Stop saying that. Why are you here? You heard father was dead and thought you'd claim his crown? No, I only heard he died after we docked. You just happened to show up on Pike right before the King's Moot? And another nod to the books. They crossed it with Euron's story, but hey, it made it in. Rian tells Yari he wants her to sit the sea stone chair, and he wants to help her get there. Time to travel north to check in on what could be one of the greatest villains in TV history. Do you know who I am? A lord. Yes, a lord. You've seen my banners? Does that worry you at all? Do you eat them after? No. Then I've seen worse. You're a good talker. Better than Theon Greyjoy. I had to work on getting him to tell me how the boy Starks escaped and the wilding woman who helped him. Ah, shit. Asha grabs the knife, but Ramsay always keeps a spare. As she lifts her arm to stab him, he sticks her up through the throat. So it looks like one of her predictions will be right, and Osha will be flayed and on one of those X's. But who will the others be? I don't think it'll be Roos. Ramsay wouldn't want to show the Northmen it was him who killed his father, even though they all already know. And I don't think it'll be Fat Walda, because she basically got ate up by the hounds. I suppose it could be Small John Umber if Ramsay suspects he's the one who planned the OSHA thing. This does, however, give me hope that Shaggy Dog is still alive. Ramsay tops off the seam, very ramsay esque by wiping off the blade he killed Asha with and then using it to slice up his apple and eat it. Now this has already been an amazing episode, but they're not through with us yet. We're back to Castle Black at a silent and awkward dinner, made even more so by Tormund stuffing his face while making goo-goo eyes at Brian. Could this be a power couple in the making? Are Ollie arrows about to fly? Stay tuned for the next episode of Northern Love Connections. Okay, back to our story. Sorry about the food. It's not what we're known for. That's all right. There are more important things. Yeah, like this note being brought in. Wait, could it be? Are they? Yes, it's the pink letter, and my GOT nerd is going ape shit on overdrive. So many jewels in this episode, and we get the cherry on top of the pink letter. You are the son of the last true warden of the North. Northern families are loyal. They'll fight for you if you ask. I'm just bouncing off the walls at this point on this episode. W wait, there's more? Are you freaking kidding me? You're gonna try to top the pink letter? Shouldn't you just stop while you're ahead? This episode has been near flawless and Dorn free. Why take a chance? And we're going back to Vastothrak? Oh well, yeah, I guess that'll be cool watching Dragon come and swoop her up again. Um, wait, this scene is in a dome. How is Drogon gonna get to you? Ow, and how are you holding that iron brazier and not screaming? The calls are having their meeting, and we find that, yeah, you're not supposed to spill any, but there's always a little blood. Ago got his head smashed by a rock. Fuck Ago. Next, they bring in Danny. It looks as if the head cow is going to let her live out her days in the Dosh Colleen, but Danny has other plans. She reminds them that this is where Khal Drago promised to cross the salt seas and kill the men in iron suits. What do you talk about? Which little village to raid? You are small men, and not fit to lead the Dothraki, so I will. The cows all get a good laugh out of this and say they'll take turns fucking her and pass what's left to their horses for more of the same. You crazy cunt. Wow, back to back weeks of the C word. Did you think we would serve you? You're not going to serve. You're going to die. And Danny lights the place on fire. But wait, George said that that was a one time deal, that she wasn't fireproof. There was magic involved. Liar! And thank you, because I did not see this scene coming. Holy shit, this fire's even bigger. And it's cohesive with the storyline, which means the clothes burned away, and it all makes sense? But your contract! Hey, I don't care if it is CGI, this scene was awesome. And what? I hear it's not CGI? That's really you? Oh my god! And the entire Kalasar bows. Danny has her army. Jor and Dario walk through and take a knee as well. Dario sees the light for the first time and bows in awe. Wow, wow, wow. That's all I can say about that. I'm giving it a triple wow. I mean, an absolutely unbelievable show. Like I said, I don't give shows tens really, but I mean, that was definitely a 9.5 for me. I mean, I was smiling for a good hour and a half after that show was over. It was, every time I thought it was done, they just gave me a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. All the way down to Tormund moving up from a bear to a brain. I mean, are you kidding me? Love is in the air. So yeah, unbelievable episode. I can't wait to look at it and watch it again. And uh, 
Game of Thrones, you are not disappointing so far. I mean, this might be my favorite season so far. I mean, it is unbelievable all the stuff they just keep giving us week after week, and it's just going to keep getting better. I can't believe we have to wait five, six, seven more days now, to, whenever you watch this, for Game of Thrones to come back on because I want to see the next one, like now. So, yeah, it's your boy DJ11. That's another recap. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, go ahead and thumbs up it. And if you want, go ahead and subscribe, and you'll be the first to know when another video comes out. So until next time, game on.